I stayed overnight in Pentwater on Monday with my mom and just we just took the day off. I got my hair done. I don't know if you can see my stripes. I got my hair done by a high school friend. Pentwater is my hometown. And so, you know, it's it's really home territory. It was weird because, you know, everyone I grew up with is gone for the most part, but there are people here and there that know me or that I ran into, and that was kind of cool. And then um, got my hair done, and then my aunt and my best friend since uh, first grade came and joined me, and we, and my mom, we all stayed out at my dad's um, house on the lake, and that was really nice. Uh, Tracy and I had to like light the pilot on the stove and things like that, the, not the stove, the, the water heater and you know, things like that, like just getting the systems up and going because he's down in Florida and uh, he lives down there full time and just comes up for a little bit in the summer to enjoy Michigan weather, beautiful summers in Michigan. Anyway, so gorgeous fall weather, well no, rain and clouds and cold. That whole week was like that. Like, yay, Michigan! But um, we stayed up at the lake and then got up in the morning, parked one car in one town, parked the other car in Pentwater, had uh, breakfast, and then my aunt, my mom went back to Grand Rapids, and my aunt and my friend and I walked um, about eight miles to my best friend from fifth grade's uh, house. And then uh, my aunt gave, we, and rather than, we were going to drive out to my stepdad's farm. My stepmother invited me to stay with them. But rather than going directly there, we drove back to Pentwater because we'd made really good time, actually, it was fast. As we were walking along, a woman pulled up and stopped, and she is the daughter of the woman who lived across the street from us my entire childhood and up until recently she passed away recently and i used to go just go over to fern's house and i wouldn't even knock you know that kind of neighborhood you go in here fern hi are you home but anyway she had passed away and, and her daughter stopped and said hi laura i thought you in the paper and say hi to your mom and it was very kind of you know out on a country road but running into people i know um it's very weird to be back in home territory. It doesn't actually feel like I walked here. <laughs> Just strange. So, and beautiful and wonderful. So anyway, my aunt drove me back into Pentwater. The woman who lived next door to me growing up, whose daughter I used to play with, still owns the house next door. And randomly my mom and I had run into her the, the day before and she said, oh, if you want to see the old house, I can uh, call the owners and see if you can get in there. I have the key. And so I said, yeah, sure. So when we drove back into town, my aunt, my friend went back home to Indiana. She'd driven like six hours to walk eight miles with me. <laughs> and anyway, um, we uh, went to the farm. And I don't know, first we went to my old house that I grew up in and had a tour of it. And it's like bizarre old world. You know, my old bedroom is tiny. It's really small. I don't remember it being small like that. And everything's renovated and beautiful, which also was not what I was growing up. Like the house that, you know, we didn't really leave, intend to live there for, or my mom, especially for like 32 years. You know, she didn't really mean to stay there for 32 years. It didn't happen that way. But it was nice to see everything in town has gotten a facelift. And even the Antler Bar, just very strange. But it's nice too, it's nice to see that my small hometown is thriving after being through some towns that, you know, they lost they lost whatever industry they had. They lost whatever made that town shine and that water's always been a tourist town. It's still a tourist town. And the wire works factory is still there, you know, so it's still a working class town too. So then we went out to my aunt drove me out to the farm, which is where I was gonna stay that night. And I got to See my, it's my stepdad and my mom split up years and years ago and he remarried and his wife and I are, are friends and my stepdad passed away before I started this journey. So this journey, the whole journey, the day I told him I was coming home, that night he died. And so this journey has been a bit of an homage to him because he's part of my spirit of adventure. You know, that's where I get it from. So I went out to the farm and the farm is also being renovated. You know, Mary's doing a beautiful job of like fixing things up. She's having a new kitchen done. She did, she's like, I'm taking you out for eat to eat because I want to take you out to eat and because we don't have a stove. 
<laughs> so you're not going to cook here. <laughs> and I found it. I asked her. Somehow we got on the store on the line. Well, I got to see the the ashes, piece of ashes, and she had set it up, and we cried a little bit. And then we ended up pulling out some old photographs, some of which belonged really to like my mom, and were pictures of my brother when he was little, stuff like that that she wouldn't want. So we just went through those, and while well, my aunt and I were there before my aunt went back to Grand Rapids, and then she brought a bunch of stuff back for my mom, and that was sweet. And was you know looking through and seeing pictures of you know my life. Girl growing up, not not baby pictures, but like my teen years. A lot of them, a lot of the pictures that Pete had taken with him in the divorce were pictures of all of us as a family. So it was very poignant. And I never lived out at the farm, but it was a lot of my teen years going out there and working on motorcycles and mowing the grass for four hours and picking apples and picking blackberries and picking raspberries and you know, wild strawberries and stuff like that. So my summers, the farm is, is my, you know, my summer memories are wrapped up in a lot of things having to do with hot water and the beach and heart and the farm. I was very glad that I got to stay out there. Then I walked to Rothbury and stayed with her friend, Mary's friend, Mary and Lizzie. That's what I was saying. I have a, I have a little stepsister named Lizzie who graduated from high school this year. And she treats me very much like an older sister, even though I'm like a much older sister <laughs> and live far away and uh, anyway it was nice to see them so i stayed with her friend judy and their family in rothbury and again it was one of those like blah, walking days and there's this beautiful walk in the woods and i walked part of it and at some point you kind of get creeped out you're like i'm too much on a bicycle trail in the woods when nobody's out at all so i walked along the road for part of it and along the bicycle trail for part of it and then um she took me around to the JJ Ranch and told me about that area. It's uh, one of the things that keeps Rothbury thriving. Is it's been a dude ranch since the 20s, and now it's a dude ranch, but it also has like an old time town, you know, and then it also has like venues and it also has a golf course. <laughs> you can do it all. It's a water park. <laughs> so she showed me all of that, and a lot of that's been developed in the last I don't know, five or six years. So I don't remember that stuff from growing up. Everyone's, everyone's got a face, facelift all up and down the coast of Michigan because tourism is it, you know. And then I walked into Montague and I didn't have anything lined up. Nothing worked for having anything lined up. So my mom called around and found me a place to stay with a, a Lutheran deaconess. And I asked her what a deaconess was because I didn't know. And she said, well, in the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, you can't be a pastor if you're a woman, but you can be a deaconess. And then you take over a lot of the pastor's duties that aren't being, you know, aren't preaching. And you, you can't do the sacrament, but you can do a lot of other duties. So that was really interesting. She had a big dog named Lam Lambo. He was so big that she said she went through a drive-through once, and they're like, "Why do you have a bear in your car?" <laughs> he really was that big, but he, she said he had lost a bunch of weight. <laughs> she inherited him from someone else who didn't walk him enough, apparently. So Lambo was adorable, and we went over to her friend's house, and she'd cooked dinner, and she had a, you know, she also had a dog, so it was, you know, the dog complained, and we were all hanging out and chatting every night, but I was exhausted, because that was one of those cold, it was just cold and rainy, it was just how my childhood of Michigan, as I remember, <laughs> and then the next day, I got up to walk some skiing. Still didn't have anything lined up for that. I thought Michigan would be easier, and it, you know, it because I know a lot of people there. But you know, this, this is the same thing. It's always kind of like, well, it's fine. I'm gonna walk and see what happens. And that day there were 50 mile per hour gusts of wind and rain and cold, and I'm like, yay! But it was really beautiful walking still, just through the woods, and it's. Something I've been thinking about since I reached Michigan is Michigan has really big trees. Like very tall and very big. I guess it's because there are a lot of oak trees, old oak trees. So everything, you know, on when you're not on the main highways, everything off of that is like the woods until you get to a town or the lake. And um, the causeway, I walk town and a gentleman comes up to me and just says, what are you doing? And we chit chatted, I told him, and he's like, that's really interesting. And he said, I'm going to contact the Muskegon Chronicles. Oh, okay, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I love press. That's fine. And he, he texts me about an hour later, 
and I hadn't reached my host yet. And he says, well, the Muskegon Chronicle is going to run the paper because the Grand Rapids Press has already written something in their sister paper. So I said, oh yeah, cool. And he said, and by the way, I'm really good friends with the Ostroms who you're staying with tonight. The one random person I talked to just out on the street in Muskegon, which is a town of, I don't know, 30,000, 50,000 people. I don't know. I don't even know. It might be 100,000. Probably not. Anyway, it's not a small, small town. The one person I talked to randomly that day was not just friends, but good friends with my host for the evening. And it turns out that Mr. Ostrom ran the newspaper for 40 years. He was a publisher. And he just retired recently, so we talked about retirement. And they were very nice. And they were leaving to drive to Washington, D.C. the next morning. And they hosted me anyway, because, you know, a friend asked them to. And then I then again got up and walked to the next day. And it was a much nicer day, pretty out. You know, nice walk. Oh, the other thing in Muskegon, I forgot about that. The woman who picked me up wasn't Kay, because Kay was busy packing, so she had her friend Mary pick me up, and she drove me down to the lake. She drove me through downtown, which has been all renovated. Everything's renovated in Western Michigan, despite the economy. Anyway, and then we went down to the lakefront, and it's just, I always forget how completely gorgeous Lake Michigan is. I know it is, I miss it. There's something, there's something in me from growing up right near Lake Michigan that I always, say it's like the lake at the bottom of my heart and when I'm even though I love the desert I love desert life I love the weather I mean it couldn't have been nastier and yuckier to welcome me into like Western Michigan like here it's rain and cold and 50 mile per gust but even then it's just so beautiful to me and I think it's beautiful to most people and it's kind of pristine beaches there's no condo crap there's no vendors there's no ugly restaurants it's just sand and beach grass, and forest, and water. And it's beautiful water. So it was really great that she took me around to see that. She, she pointed out where her husband proposed to her 40 years before. So right there on the beach. So anyway, and then um, the next morning I walked to Ravina, or as they all call it, Ravana. And it was pretty out, it was nice, and I walked along a, a bicycle trail, and it was a Saturday, so all these cyclists were stopping and saying, we read about you in the paper, we saw you in the paper, oh, we support you, that's so neat that you're doing this. So sometimes the press is, in, is like, there have been times on this journey where I, I didn't want press, and or not that I didn't want press, but I got press and it seemed overwhelming. And then other times when no one was talking, no one knew what I was doing, and I was just a weird woman walking down the road with some strange equipment. And it's been a pretty nice balance of like, I get to a point where I'm like, I don't want to be talked to by everybody. Like people stop and go, oh, can I have your autograph? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so there's this ebb and flow of like kind of feeling famous for a little while, like local celebrity, and then like easing off just when I'm need a break from that kind of socializing and then and it's there's at the heart of my project it is just people being kind to a stranger so when you're kind of a local celebrity you're not really a stranger anymore anyway and then at the point where I'm feeling like it'd be nice if everyone just kind of knew me and would have just invite me to their home I get pregnant anyway but that was so I talked to a lot of people on the bicycle trail and it was a beautiful day and I strolled into town and I thought I could stroll into town and maybe just find something I've done that other places but I've walked too many miles. I've walked, I don't know, like 18 miles that day. And I, I was tired, just tired. And so I chatted a little bit with people and, you know, I actually, walking into Ravana, that's not true. I wasn't on the bicycle trail. I'm sorry. I walked along Apple Avenue. It's wrong. Bicycle trail was the next day. But, you know, I was walking along Apple Avenue and being, you know, being contacted by the Weather Channel. and. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Phoenix's, uh, Fox News, and things like that. I was doing interviews while walking long distance. That was the day that I was really tired and didn't talk to anybody much on the road and got into Ravana and nothing had worked out through anybody anywhere. And I called my mom and said, I'm just tired. And she said, why don't I get you and you stay at your cousin Rachel's house? And I didn't really want to go to Grand Rapids in a car. I really wanted to, like my first experience in Grand Rapids to be walking into town, but you know what? I went to stay the night at my cousin Rachel's house, and that was really lovely. And then the next day, that was when I was walking into Walker. And I think it's really funny that my last stop was Walker. <laughs> so I walked into Walker, 
had a beautiful, that was a beautiful day on the bicycle trail of us people stopping and chatting with me. And Linda and Jim Thurber came and picked up. And these are friends of my brother and sister-in-law that they have known since their kids were toddlers. Their oldest is like off in college on both sides. They're 19 year olds, um, grown-ups. So long-term family friends. And they took me out for dinner that night and my sister-in-law and her boyfriend and the kids came and and, you know, Maggie couldn't come. I'm sorry, she's old. She's a college student. She's busy. Anyway, they came and it was just. Oh, and I had an interview. At, I stood next to the bathroom having an interview with um, the star. The star. <laughs> so, or Arizona star? Arizona star. Anyway, I uh, was having an interview next to the bathroom and I saw my family came, come in and I'm like, very short walk to my mom's house, nine miles, and I walked into town, and I had kind of, we'd contacted different people, lots of different people wanted to walk with me into Grand Rapids, and I thought somebody would, but it didn't really work out, it was, you know, Monday, you know, in the middle of the morning, and, but my cousin Rachel wanted to come walk with me, I said, okay, that's great, and she, she finally joined me for the last mile, she came on her bicycle, and Fox News in Grand Rapids actually wanted to interview me also, and they came and talked to my mom, which was funny because she said, I just gotten home from the gym, and they called me, I'm like, we're here, can we come talk to you? And she's like, in her gym clothes, so going, yes, yes, sure, why not? <laughs> and then they you know, came and talked to me, and then they went back and waited while Rachel and I walked up to the front door, and I, you know, came, gave my mom a big hug, and I had seen my mom already. She greeted me at the ferry. We went out to dinner with my friend Karen. She stayed overnight with me in Peltwater and then again at my dad's house. And then, you know, she'd come to pick me up to take me to Rachel's house. But still, this was the last moment, you know? This was it. You know, what my one of my very best friends in Tucson, mom died on this trip. And at one point we were talking, and it was just normal conversation just talking about what I'm doing and she started to cry and she said, I can't do this project. I don't have a home with And I thought a lot about what home means on this trip. And home is my dad. You know? Home is my mom. Home is the journey I've traveled on and the places I've gone and the homes that have welcomed me and the home on my back. So I walked up to a home I'd never been to before, you know, my mom's new home. But I also went to my old home, you know, Pelt Water, and I also got to see the farm, which is another form of home for me. And just being in Michigan, it feels like home. So, beautiful journey. And my mom and I had talked about the sadness of wrapping up a big journey. She was, we were both feeling happy and nostalgic about my trip, you know. My mom did the mom report every morning, you know, and then she's like, I, I, you know, don't have the, you know, task anymore. It's like this, this thing that we were creating together this whole time. Um, and then since then, I've been walking around Art Prize and talking to the artists that I, because I, everybody else has been at Art Prize for two weeks, you know, and I just got here, and it's a weird feeling of like, it's it's I think it's a fantastic, amazing event with all these people all excited about artwork in the city, but I didn't even vote for anybody, not even myself. I didn't vote at all in the whole thing. I wasn't even here, and when I got here, it was just the last two days of voting and the first day I thought I was going to go right downtown and look at everything instead I took like you know a couple hour nap and <laughs> bust around <laughs> finally went down to the gallery and you know it had my reception the night that I got to my mom's house we went down for the reception again friends and family and you know old friends I haven't seen in forever showed up so it's 
it's always a weird thing to finish a big project. You need, you need a lot of decompression. And my decompression has partly been just wandering around Grand Rapids. My friend Nico came into town and we've been looking at lots of art exhibits and you know, kind of showing him Grand Rapids too. So anyway. And then I won on awards. <laughs> that was a big shocker. Pardon me? Yeah, I didn't, I, you know, we went to the award ceremony and I said, Mom, it's so cool that we got to go to the award because they invited me for free because I was on the jury shortlist. I said, but I'm not going to win anything, you know, but it's really cool that I got invited to the party. And then the first cash prize that they talked about was sustainability. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, and I'm thinking it might be time-based or something. There were a bunch of different jury awards, like six of them. And I'm like, kind of half listening. And then they're like, and the winner is Laura Milkins. And I'm like... No. <laughs> I was like, really? Wow. And my mom just whooped. My aunt whooped. And, you know, they were like hugging me. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so I'll have to go back and listen to the, because they did little video clips with the jurors where they talked about why they selected the work that they selected. And I was like, you know, I, I, I'll have to listen to it again because I was really hugging family going. <laughs> and in the after party, they asked, you know, what, 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 how does it feel to pick, be picked for a juried award, which is uh, kind of an award for more your peer group than it is the popular vote. And for me, I, I honestly, from the very get-go on this, I had told people, I'm not going to win art prize. I'm not doing it for that. It isn't that kind of piece, you know, just a big computer screen in the gallery. Unless it gets some sort of national press or just get picked up online in some way. It's it's not likely that somebody would walk into a gallery, see a big TV screen with me going, you know, the landscape going like this and go, yes! You know, it, 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 people vote for like giant statues and stuff way more than they want to vote for a TV screen. And I totally understand that. That's So I told people, it's, I'm not going to win an art prize. And then with the jury prizes, I feel like my work doesn't fit in the museum space. It's not that kind of work. So I didn't think jury to work was even anything that I'd be considered for either. So I, so when they asked, you know, how does it feel to be selected for a jury to work, you know, kind of jury of your peers rather than, you know, public vote, I said, well, I just didn't think I, I didn't think I'd be considered. I didn't think I was part of that world. And I guess I am. That's nice. Unexpected. I to write the juror a big thank you letter. <laughs> so. Yeah, and overall, just the welcome I've had to Grand Rapids. I mean, once you're on the news, too, people are always like, cool, you're that walker. So, anyway. Yeah, nice wrap up. Nice, there's a nice big, huge citywide party for my journey. It has nothing to do with me, but it's nice. <laughs> and some of it, you know, like TV supervises and like interviews, so it sort of has to do with me. Yep, eighth, ninth, and I'm I'm uh, done. I can go back to wearing normal clothing. I can pack up my computer. <laughs> I don't have to wear it all day, every day. I don't have to wear my little webcam. I can go to the grocery store without being a public spectacle. I can go for a run. I haven't been for a run in five months, and I love running. So I haven't been up to a movie theater. I mean, it, it didn't fry these computers, which I find shocking. These are great, great, great computers. They're really good. I would like clunk it out and sand would pour out of it, you know, and then just use the other one the next day, you know? <laughs> They'd be fine. 100 degree heat every day for five months, or not five months, five weeks, you know, and they just kept going. And I had one time when it, it was 113 degrees and I walked 18 miles, and at the end of 18 miles, one of my computers was like, no more, and it just stopped. <laughs> But mostly it worked. It worked. I did it. It worked. I made technology actually work for 2,000 miles through back road, country roads and state highways and county roads and on farms and in ranch country and through flooded areas and over hills and dales and mountains and grasslands and, and it worked. 
it worked perfectly and there were, you know, technical blah to like making any of this stuff be something, but people watched it. A lot of people I've met here were like, I found out about you from Kickstarter. I've been watching since the beginning. And I'm like, wow, like in no way did they ever communicate with me on this at all. And I just watched it, so it worked.